Hello and greetings. Welcome to the latest in the Thunderbird series of webinars on finance and sustainability. I'm Anne Florini. I teach in the Washington DC Center of Thunderbird and I am very glad to welcome you to the latest in today's seminar. Today, we're going to be talking about the global food system. Um, before we get to that, I'd like to give you a little bit of context about the webinar series. And then I'd also like to introduce my colleagues from George Washington University who are very kindly co-sponsoring today's webinar. Why are we talking about finance and sustainability or commerce and sustainability more broadly? Well, the global financial system is facing rather extraordinary new pressures to become sustainable, not only financially stable, but also and simultaneously environmentally friendly and socially inclusive. These pressures are partly political. They are re a reaction to the increasing financialization of the economy and frankly, the sector's failure to steer financial investment to where humanity needs it most. We're seeing all sorts of policy responses. Top public authorities are convening in things like the new network of central banks and supervisors on greening the financial system. We're seeing the private sector moving rapidly from corporate social responsibility to what's now called ESG investing, environmentally, socially, and governance focused uh, risks and opportunities in their investments. And all of this is happening in the context of the increasingly obvious need to be thinking about whole systems, not tweaking little pieces, but the global energy system, the global food system, all the systems that make civilization possible because it is becoming apparent that the current arrangements for all of these systems are not compatible with what humanity needs and what the planet can allow. So this finance and sustainability webinar series explores these urgent questions with some of the world's leading thinkers and practitioners, two of whom we have with us today. So that's from the Thunderbird side. I am delighted to co-host this webinar once again with the Institute for International Economic Policy at the Elliott School at George Washington University, also here in Washington, DC. And with that, let me turn it over to its director, Jay Shambaugh, for his opening comment. Thanks very much, Anne. Uh, good morning or good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are or when you're watching this. Uh, I'm Jay Shambaugh, I'm the director of the Institute for International Economic Policy or IIEP as we call it here at uh, George Washington University. Um, we're really pleased to be co-hosting this event on food systems at a crossroads, along with our co-hosts at Thunderbird as part of our ongoing series in rethinking capitalism and democracy. Um, for those of you who don't know IAEP, IAEP is located at the Elliott School at GW and is a cross-school interdisciplinary research center at GW. We aim to serve as a catalyst for high quality um, interdisciplinary research on policy issues surrounding um, economic globalization. And so we interpret that mandate quite broadly. So it can include um, support for research in areas of trade or finance or development um, or poverty studies or climate change or really economic policy more broadly. We've been hosting a number of series virtually uh, during the pandemic on inequality, on China's economy, India's economy, rethinking capitalism and democracy, um, as well as some other events. So please take a look at our website if you'd like to see prior events. If you're over the summer just feeling starved for content, um, there's quite a bit up there from the last year. Um, so without further ado, um, welcome virtually to DC, to GW, and let me turn it over to IAP Distinguished Visiting Scholar, Sunil Sharma, to talk more about uh, the series in today's event. Thank you, Anne and Jay. Let me add my welcome uh, to everybody. Today we have the eighth seminar in the monthly series on rethinking capitalism and democracy, and we are glad to have it co-sponsored by ASU Thunderbird series on finance and sustainability. In the rethinking capitalism and democracy series, we've covered several systemic issues. Valuing nature and biodiversity, taking stock of climate change, emerging architecture of global finance, governing finance for sustainability, rethinking financial regulation, peace as a prerequisite for systemic stability and change, and in the last seminar, we covered policy choices and contagion. Last month's seminar on policy choices and contagion addressed policy choice and design and issues related to trust, cohesion, information, understanding, and communication. We examined behavioral contagion and how ideas and behaviors often spread and how policies can foster changes in norms and hence 
individual and collective actions that can aid societies in addressing systemic challenges. Last month's discussion is quite relevant today. Today's seminar on food systems at a cross with another funda fundamental systemic issue for humankind, what we eat and its nutritional quality, how we produce it, how we distribute it, and what effect we have on mother nature. Here too, if the time constraints imposed by looming climate change are taken seriously, the solution will surely involve changing norms and consumer, producer, and government behavior. Hopefully we can enable a virtuous cycle for both human welfare and environmental sustainability. Let me add on our seminar series that we will be taking a summer break for July and August, and we will be back in September. With those brief remarks, let me turn back to Anne for introducing the speakers and moderating the seminar. Anne. Thanks, Jay and Sunil. Um, as you can imagine, this has been rather an exciting year for all of us in, the, in these combined seminar series. These are the most important topics facing the world, we believe. So let's get to today's session and today's extraordinary speakers. So we're talking about food systems. We know we need systemic approaches to do that. We know that these are intertwined with all the other global systems. We know that there are great business opportunities, great new markets that are emerging. But for those to come about, we're going to need policy changes as well. So what we're going to do today is start with Nicoletta Battini from the International Monetary Fund, whom I will introduce in just a second. But she has just come out with a really wonderful book that she's going to be speaking from in this series that is the single best source that I have yet seen that explains why there are such problems with the global food system and propose, the book proposes a whole range of solutions, policy solutions, market solutions. It is a bit unusual in that it is very tied to on the ground realities and at the same time is extraordinary in the depth of its understanding of the policy changes that need to take place. Um, before she starts, please feel free to put questions um, as they occur to you. Please put them in the Q&A. The chat will not be monitored for, for questions or discussions. So, Nicoletta Bettini is the lead evaluator of the International Monetary Fund's Independent Evaluation Office. Before she was at the IMF, she was advisor to the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee. She has also been professor of economics at the University of Surrey and director of the International Economics and Policy Office of the Treasury in Italy. So quite an international background. She holds a PhD in international finance and a PhD in monetary economics at the University of Oxford. And today she's focusing her research on the economics of energy and land and sea use transitions for climate mitigation. So her new book, which I strongly encourage all of you to get and to read, is The Economics of Sustainable Food, Smart Policies for People and the Planet, which was just published by Island Press and the International Monetary Fund. Nicoletta, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anne and Jay and Sunil. Uh, it's truly fantastic to, to be here today and share some thoughts about this, this very critical issue. Today, my goal is to explain why food systems are a key driver of climate change and many other socioeconomic and socioecological ills. Uh, the good news I bear today is that, as Anne said, there, there are solutions to this and these are quite viable and that the transformation actually has already happened. And after me, uh, Bruce Friedrich, who's a co-author of the book, uh, will speak and, and tell us, you know, uh, give us an angle on that. And, and that's really exciting news. So I will not be able to go into all of the details of the book. And uh, that's why, you know, we, we wrote it down. But um, uh, I will try to cover enough to kind of stimulate your interest into the macroeconomics of this topic and why uh, uh, share, share our views of why this is so important. I will start sharing the screen now. So uh, as Anne said, I work at the IMF and uh, uh, in the independent evaluation office. So just let me stress, this is of course not work of the independent evaluation office. Uh, it's research, but the book is published also by the IMF. Um, so there's a disclaimer here. Um, 
first of all, I would like to start to say that, um, you know, as we know, there are two big sources of greenhouse gas emissions. If we think about climate change is one of the main issues that we are concerned about today. One is energy and one is food production. And uh, sometimes it's argued that um, we should focus on one or the other, but this is really a false dichotomy. So to understand why it's a false dichotomy, we need to uh, look and understand where most emissions that we worry about come from. And, and this is actually not straightforward. Uh, so the chart to the left here, the kind of round chart shows um, uh, based on IPCC quantification for the year 2016, that almost three quarters of emissions come from energy use, that's the red part of the pie chart, and almost one fifth come from agriculture, uh, forestry and land use. And then the remaining eight, uh, which is 5.2 plus 3.2, eight and something is from industry and waste. And, why is it confusing? Because you know the IPCC sectoral aggregation is not the aggregation that we use in economics under the you know, industrial uh, classification uh, of economic activities, which wouldn't have energy as a sector, okay? So you would have things like transport and electricity and so forth. Uh, so people say, well, you know, agriculture is not that big. I mean, it's about a fifth, um, but actually, uh, Emissions from the food system, so agri-food, uh, increased to 26 to 34 percent. This is the chart to the right with the big columns. Uh, when we consider the food system as a whole, including you know the uh, all the land use that goes through for agriculture production, and then processing, packaging, transport, and retail, and also post retail. And so um, the here two studies are shown. CRIPA is the more recent one and it's probably a little bit more accurate because it's based on a new database called Edgar Food, which uses emission database of global atmospheric research and then uh, Faustat emission database uh, to complement that. Mind you that the IPCC puts the, the upper bound of the agri-food system, not at 34, but at 37% of all emissions. So, um, as a result of this, you know, um, even if we stop burning all fossil fuels tomorrow, this chart shows in blue, the blue bar on the top is the uh, business as usual scenario for food emissions from 2020 to 2100, so the end of the century. So if we just left the system as it is, you know, just uh, doing what it does as it does it now, um, you know, we, we would be in trouble um, because in fact, uh, on its own, this, this food system can actually uh, drive us way past our uh, 1.5 uh, Celsius limit. You see there are th three or four, there are four vertical bars on this chart. The first one is a 67% chance of us hitting the 1.5 Celsius limit by 2100, then a 50 chance of that goal and then we go to the two celsius and two celsius 50 chance so the, the very first one which we really want to try to stay within is the first vertical line uh to to the right of the zero and and that would be you know basically trashed two or three times by just the food system so um even if we start burning fossil fuels tomorrow if we, which is an impossibility we would still go well beyond that target and we would barely miss the 2% target, which is you know, the third line on this chart. We would be actually left with only 49 billion tons of CO2 from, for all non-food sectors. But that's not you know, uh, 49 billion tons per year. That's 49 billion tons split over 80 years. And this is work by Clark on science. So, Raining food system emissions is key to securing our goals and we cannot ignore it. Uh, we always knew that we needed to mitigate emissions from food systems because, uh, you know, Johan Roxham and uh, several other scientists wrote what they called a road roadmap for rapid decar decarbonization just after the Paris Agreement to show, okay, we have a target now, how do we get there? And one of the three pillars they laid down was the food system. Uh, but reducing emissions from this system is, is complex. It's not just like energy where 
you know, you go at the source of the energy and the power generation and, and you change it to a, either a renewable or a nuclear, uh, you know, source so that, you know, you're either a totally zero carbon or, or very low carbon and you just fix the problem, you know, up front. This, there, we need to here act on a menu of solutions uh, to address this system. Uh, this include changes to diet, changes to, you know, food, the way we waste food, um, trying to eliminate it, improvements in agricultural practices, resilience and efficiency, and technologies that make low carbon food alternatives uh, scalable and affordable. So one area of intervention I want to draw your attention here is, is really important is the livestock sector. And that's for two reasons. So the chart, the pie chart to the left shows that livestock is actually using a tremendous amount and portion of, of land, of farmland. Uh, basically, the, ma the majority of our farmland goes to feed animals. Uh, and then we take the animals and we eat them. And, and that is an extremely inefficient way of feeding ourselves. Uh, so um, by uh, restraining our use of meat in our diets, we can re release that land back into the wild and that has tremendous uh, carbon sequestration potential. Uh, the second reason why the livestock sector is very important is that there are huge massive differences in emissions by type of food. This is very clear now scientifically and here's a bar chart you know, based on the Eat Lancer report that shows, for example, that beef producing one kilogram of beef, uh, you know, it's uh, basically generates 60 times the amount of carbon dioxide of producing uh, a kilogram of peas. You can also do this, uh, you know, on a protein equivalent base, on a calorie equivalent base, but you pretty much get the same story. Meat and dairy are high emission and then plants are low emission. Now, the, the, the very good news is that, um, you know, it's actually not that good to eat a lot of meat. And so the health science for what's a good diet also coincide with the earth system science of what's a good diet for the planet. Uh, we can actually put this into dietary change terms. So this chart shows what can we gain in terms of emissions if we move from a more animal food diet, more animal food based diet to a less animal food based diet. And, and you can see here that these are all, you know, um, the publication in top scientific journals uh, that I quote that as you move from um, away from animal food, uh, you get really big uh, reductions in, in GHGs. Uh, and actually a, a vegan diet, which is the extreme on the spectrum, gives you, of course, the maximum benefit. Uh, but even, you know, saving um, some, some meat consumption can take you quite a, quite a long way down. Um, and mind you that, you know, annual global emissions are around, you know, 45, 50 uh, gigatons. So we're talking about here 30 percent. These bars are composed of two things, as I mentioned before. One is the direct emissions of the animals and stocks, uh, livestock uh, of greenhouse gases uh, from manure, belching and so forth, fertilizers to, you know, prepare their, uh, raise their feedstock. And two is the potential carbon sequestration is the opportunity cost of that land that could be rewilded and become a carbon sink. Um, and if you really want to be nitty picky, actually um, working on agriculture and food systems is probably extremely advantageous in a, in a race uh, against climate change because of one uh, very simple reason. Uh, a lot of emissions in agriculture like methane, uh, this is the, the chart to the left, uh, are considerably more potent at trapping heat in the short run relative to CO2. So one kilo of methane, and that's the little box I put in the middle, for example, has a global warming potential uh, equivalent to 34 kilos of CO2 over 100 years. But over 20 years, it has uh, an, a heat entrapping potential, global warming potential equivalent to 86 kilograms of CO2. So the IPCC, whenever you see a scenario by the IPCC, they still use the GWP, the Global Warming Potential 100, uh, and because that makes it easier to aggregate different greenhouse gases. 
uh, you know, uh, across. But uh, some scientists have now basically shown what happens when you properly weight or properly aggregate greenhouse gases to reflect their impact on global warming over time. And basically what they showed is that, um, and this is the panel to the right here saying falling emissions. If you cut and look at the top, you know, the top graph says emissions and it has a, a red and a blue line. So CH4 is methane, CO2 is, you know, CO is carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels. So if you cut both, you know, the same speed more or less, you get very different effects on warming in the short run. So short run meaning like five, 10 years. Uh, if you cut uh, CO2, you know, you still see an increase in warming. There's nothing you can do about it. You can stop all fossil fuel burning. You will still get that in the pipeline. But if you cut methane, you actually are reversing warming. You are now cooling the planet. So um, as the chart here to the left shows, you know, agriculture through both agriculture directly, waste, but also land use and change in forestry is releasing a lot of methane. If we work on this sector, we have a good chance to actually not just stop the clock, but maybe move the needles back. And that's extremely important result. Uh, I just also wanted to point out that there's not just emissions is the problem with the food system, but um, the food system as they're configured now is the greatest scavenger of all the um, life essential uh, natural resources that we have. Uh, most of the soil on earth, uh, soil is degraded or very degraded. Soil is really the skin of the earth, is the frontier between geology and biology. Anything that exists on the planet is because of soil. Uh, there's, you know, a few inches of matter full of, you know, life that then give life to plants that then give life to, you know, animals, including ourselves. And so forth, and that's been incredibly degraded. And the estimates now show that by 2050, it is likely that if we continue like we do, 90% of all soil will in, on the planet will be degraded. <clears throat> it's it's very loaded with chemicals um, and other uh, pathogens and things that shouldn't be there, including, of course, nitrogen and phosphorus from fertilizers. And that's completely burnt and destroyed the the livability of of this key kind of uh, mean for for life on earth a fresh water has been depleted at a rate that i cannot even you know quantify uh, i think sir henry was in a seminar here before with thunderbird and um and he just showed a really nice chart of how much water we have fresh water on the planet it's very little actually so if all the water in the planet the fresh water was 100 liters uh, uh, all, sorry, all the water we have on the planet was 100 liters. The fresh water is, would be half a teaspoon. And of that, 75% goes to agriculture. Uh, and it's being contaminated on a daily basis because, you know, it's, uh, it's being uh, used in ways that it can no longer kind of uh, be decontaminated over a human uh, time scale. Uh, then, of course, ecosystems have been destroyed. Um, there's an estimate that says, a leading estimate that says by 2040, it'll be no more fish in the oceans. Uh, end of the century, no more rainforest at this pace. And air, of course, has greater and greater concentration of ammonia, which is one of the particulates that we worry about. But this is a particular vicious one because not just it has its own uh, radiating force, uh, which uh, aggravates climate change, but also it can transport, uh, you know, uh, nitrogen uh, in, in other areas of the planet, uh, creating huge uh, disruptions to the carbon and life cycle in those, in those areas, which are remote from where the nitrogen was disposed. Uh, I just want to have one slide on biodiversity because this is really important. Agriculture is number one cause, um, food system one, one cause, biodiversity loss. Uh, this chart from actually the graphics is from the Guardian uh, shows that of all mammals on earth, 96% are now either us or our uh, farmed livestock. And we're left with only 4% of wild mammals. Um, and, and the reason of that, uh, what that, what that happens uh, when we farm so many animals, we need to get land for them as we showed at the beginning. So agriculture is the number one cause of deforestation. 
this chart here uh, from Yale uh, School of Forestry, uh, it shows that you know about 80% of all deforestation in the Amazon is from cattle ranching. 15% is soy. Uh, mind you, that soy goes to uh, feed animals either in China or in the U.S. itself. And so this is what happening. This is the chart to the right. What's happening now to species loss? Uh, you know, we're now uh, losing something in the order of 8,000 to 54,000 species a year. And that's thousands of times the, ba the, the background or normal rate of, ex of species extinction. In the past 400 years before 1970, we lost 800 species. We're now losing between 8,000 and 54,000 a year. So we're basically causing because of food system and man-made ex mass extinction. And that's an irreversible trend, of course. So um, what is, uh, what, well, one would say um, usually the answer to all these, you know, complaints from policymakers or some of these big producers is, you know, but um, agriculture has to be the way it is. It uh, has to be industrialized because it serves a higher purpose. It ensures global food security. Well, that is actually not true. The current food system is unable to feed the world. There's billions of people go uh, to bed hungry every night. Um, and, uh, you know, that's not just in the low income countries. A lot of people think, you know, okay, well, that's not my problem because it's just somewhere there in Africa. In, in 2019, um, 35 million people experience hunger in the United States, according to the USDA. While in Mexico, which is across the border uh, and has huge income differences with the United States, is the second most obese country in the world. So this is a global phenomenon, uh, malnutrition, both under and overnutrition is a global phenomenon. Um, and this is going to get worse um, because of the pressures that we have on population dietary shifts. So I have some scary food math here to the right. Uh, it's been calculated by 2050, we need double food production because we're going to have 2 billion more people. That's a UN median fertility projection. And people are changing taste and diets in emerging countries. You know, if they can put their hands on you know, food like meat and dairy, they, they will because, you know, they... Uh, they're coming from diets that didn't use much of that. And of course, it's, it's part of the affluence and the scaling up the food chain. And a lot more of the crops are used also for biofuels. But because of climate change, uh, water scarcity, um, tribal farmers, which you know, are no longer a profitable profession and, uh, in, in many, many verses, uh, there is actually uh, the possibility that we might lose half of the existing food supply. So now we're going to have way less food that, than we would need for all this extra people and ourselves. And we're really going straight like a, you know, a, a train with no brakes towards a global agriculture of food and, and water crisis. There's of course massive economic costs to food systems as they are now. So there are costs because of diets that are wrong. Seven to 10 people globally die of non-communicable diseases. The WHO, uh, has you know proved that uh, uh, a lot of these diseases, you know, diabetes, obesity, cancers, uh, cardiovascular, are preventable uh, through changes in lifestyle, primarily changes in diets. You know, 90% of obesity, diabetes can be eliminated uh, if people adopted the right diet. Or would never be you know that 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 pathology, that morbidity, would never show up. 80% uh, of cardiovascular disease, diseases. Um, and of course, people say, well, you, you know, you got to die of something. But what we're talking about here are morbidities in, in court, uh, in ages that where these diseases shouldn't be showing up. And a lot of these are all premature deaths. And so, you know, when people are sick in, in working age and then they die prematurely, that has enormous implications for labor productivity. Uh, for early retirement, and these have an immediate and direct effect on GDP for a country. Uh, if you are obese, it's much more difficult to find a job. I mean, this OECD has, you know, an entire volume of studies on this. And of course, there are all the medical costs, healthcare costs, um, you know, a good 60% or 70% of what the United States spends on healthcare spending 
goes to address these uh, non-communicable diseases. It raises a lot of private debt. Again, making the example of the US, 75% of all American private debt is for medical bills. And then of course, it creates an enormous uh, natural capital depreciation. Natural capital is an asset. We, we value it at zero, but we shouldn't as the uh, Partha Desgupta has shown us is tremendous value. And we are you know, eroding that really fast. So I just made a, if you make a really quick calculation, um, and uh, you know, the cost of overweight. And then for example, just this year, we had a pandemic which emerged from habitat degradation related to food and wildlife uh, consumption of exotic animals. And uh, uh, the cost of that was you know, something in the order now estimated 16 trillion go globally. The cost of antimicrobial resistance, which originates predominantly in uh, animal agriculture, industrial agriculture and CAFOs, and the cost of biodiversity loss. I mean, we're talking really just in one year, okay, just take 2020, like a third of global uh, war product uh, because of the way we run the food system. So these, these are not macroeconomic costs. These are global planetary economic systemic situations that we're creating with this food system. There's also uh, another um, aspect, which is uh, like a consequence of the mismanagement uh, of land and soil and fresh water, uh, which is invisible sometimes to the eye domestically, but this is going on, it's been going on now for, for a couple of decades. So a lot of countries have degraded their soil so much and uh, uh, you know, depleted their water uh, so much through agriculture um, and sometimes also other activities like industrial and haven't thought about the need they had for agriculture, that water, that they actually had to actively go out and buy land in other places to guarantee at least the minimum food security for their people. So here the chart to the left, which is a map of the world, uh, comes from Land Matrix, which is an organization that shows large scale land acquisitions uh, as food prices skyrocketed back you know, in the, 2007, eight, um, and some some of the countries just felt they couldn't afford that, and uh, also they couldn't use their own land because it was used to full capacity, given yields and water. So they went out and bought, you know, bought land in in poorer countries where land is, is cheap. The problem with this is that, you know, if you look at the chart to the right, where land is being bought is usually in countries that have a really high global hunger index. So we're basically taking away the plate from you know, the, um, the poor people of the world to, to feed ourselves in a system which pr privileges meat consumption and a very inefficient use of our land and water resources. And by the way, um, there's a huge risk uh, that land grabbing, as I've just shown, aggravates biodiversity because as you can see from this, uh, this double uh, cha chart here, the 87% um, of land grabs occur in region of medium to high terrestrial biodiversity. So, you know, when, when you go and buy land large scale, you usually do it to fall down trees and, and do, you know, palm oil or other livestock operations. And that is exactly where we have the last pockets of biodiversity that we desperately need to continue to exist. Now land grab has also uh, responded um, uh, to the progressive blurring of the line between finance and food provisioning. So globally food systems now are very concentrated and are being financialized. And, and this is a, not just the land grab, but really, you know, uh, those in finance be, took a, an active interest in, in agriculture as, a, as an asset, as a speculation object and vice versa, those that were in agriculture in these big concentrated oligopolistic systems, they have gone and financialized themselves. And that led to, chart to the left here, uh, the dash line, you know, to a, a really huge and fast appreciation of global farmland values, which outperform all commodities. And this is, you know, I work at the IMF and you rarely hear talking about this. We talk a lot about, uh, you know, financial markets, other things, commodities, but I mean, the price of farmland is an unbelievable, you know, uptick in last year's and it keeps going up. And also, as the land has become, you know, the new, the new gold, 
uh, to the right, you know, food is the new oil. I mean, food keep food prices keep going up. They keep going up, and the last uptick is 2020. Um, and uh, you know, this is gonna be felt at the grocery store, but it's also gonna be felt uh, dramatically with humanitarian crisis in a lot of countries that have uh, very low incomes and are now cut out of this in this food market. So what's the role of public policy in fostering a food system transformation? This is really now the focus of the book. So the book does set out the environmental and economic challenges posed by the food system, but it really wants to, to tell people how can we solve this? What are, what are we looking at in terms of you know, levers? And uh, maybe we should start with, you know, how did we get here? How do we get to this kind of consolidation, mechanization, industrialization? and degradation of the environment to produce a food that is just uh, is just uh, focused on quantities and yields and not on quality and, and justice. And, and the, here I bring the example of the US, but it really it's a, it's a global story. I could show you the European Union, I could show you even China or India. And, uh, there's a role of policy because policy has obviously um, uh, fostered, you know, consolidation. Uh, this all started, you know, after the, the, the Second World War. Some countries thought, you know, the, they wanted to become food secure, and it was important to, you know, to give money to the farmers, so the farmers, you know, grow stuff for the for people that were urbanized, and and that was all all good. Um, but the truth is that, you know, this took a life of its own and the subsidies ended up leading to overproduction. Overproduction uh, led to, you know, lower food prices that pushed away smaller farmers because it wasn't profitable and led to more consolidation. In the U.S., for example, agricultural subsidies go predominantly to grains and meat and dairy. You see the first chart to the left, very little to fruit and vegetables. Uh, a lot of that is imported. And uh, and again, here's a story that we had at the beginning. A lot of these grains go to feed animals. That's the, the, the middle chart here, the center chart, the yellow area, and then targeted biofuel. And uh, there's a regulation to use biofuel for uh, in gasoline, 10% in the US. Um, and so really it's not to feed people, but to feed cars and animals. And you see that now uh, this is the USDA distribution of food energy prices, food energy meaning you know, energy for us as animals. And you can see what's the outcome of that. The distortion it causes on prices is all too evident for all percentiles. You know, fruits and vegetables are the most expensive items. Uh, whereas, you know, WHO, Eat Lancet, everybody says we need to eat, you know, predominantly Food, fruit and vegetables, and then maybe a little tiny bit of meat, maybe uh, a little tiny bit of dairy. Uh, so this is really uh, the output of these policies is the opposite of what you know is nutritionally recommended. So we need to act on this on these areas of distortion, basically. And there are four areas of distortions that now exist: the, the clustered and food supply, food demand, food waste, and conservation. These are all endpoints that are essential. We can't not work on any of these uh, aspects and they're, they're really key. Um, and they, of course, call for different policies, uh, economic policy, structure forms, and regulatory policies. Here I show, for example, um, just uh, uh, an analysis that, that looks at this into some detail. The book goes into a lot of details about the one, five Celsius scenarios for these four big areas I talked about. The, actually, the book is organized by sections. So it has a food supply for advanced economy, how to green that, how to green food supply for less advanced economies, and the same for demand, the same for food waste, and then conservation of animal and flora. Here is a scenario just to summarize one of the, one of the many studies you can find. And it shows that you know, it's, the solution really requires acting on all these areas here, you know, yields, uh, and farm practices, basically reducing or eliminating fertilizers as much as we can, uh, and uh, uh, doing some of the regenerative farming so that we can bring back some of that soil, doing some of the vertical farming so that we reduce some of the supply chain, 
uh, work on food waste, and, but mostly, more importantly, work on diets. And here are the two, you know, trays here that show plant-rich diet and healthy calories. Most people either eat too many calories or too few calories. So if we if we stabilize that to the recommended level of calories for everybody, we get quite a lot uh, of leeway in in GAGs. Uh, but the biggest bang for the buck is really going towards a plant-rich diet. So reducing, in countries that overeat meat and dairy, reducing meat and dairy drastically and increasing meat and dairy where no other proteins are accessible in countries that don't eat enough proteins. If you combine all these solutions together, none of them gets us to the one five, as you can see, is the vertical line, the first vertical line. But if you combine all of them, we get there even if we do a partial, so half of all the solutions together. Um, and then if we do all of them, we actually end up in negative emission for the entire system, food system, because we can rewild the land that we have saved. Uh, I, I don't have time to go into all of the economic policy measures that we discuss in the book. That's very uh, detailed. That's very, I think, um, uh, thorough work we do in the book. But just to give you a taste, and of course, this presentation will be made uh, available to whoever wants it. Uh, you know, on supply, you need to work on on taxes, on intensive, you know, taxing the high emitting farms and redirecting subsidies to sustainable farming practices, not to you know these grains uh, that are monocropped and use uh, chemicals and a lot of fossil fuels. Um, using, you know, credit finance is extremely important because land access is become prohibitive for younger farmers, regenerative farmers, land regulation, R&D to support sustainable practices. And Bruce will talk about it uh, quite in detail. And uh, he's, a, you know, of course, a connoisseur and just also an activist on this. And it's very important to, uh, to listen to him. Um, and then, of course, labor market and pension reforms, you know, need to advantage people that go and do the transition. Demand, I mean, it's, an, it's another area, but it goes from, uh, you know, reform of the medical system, including medical schools that have to invest much more in nutrition, part of the programs, to education reforms, market reforms. The OECD estimates every dollar you put in regulating and better regulating advertisement on food away from unhealthy foods to a healthy food, you get back $5.6. So, uh, you know, there, there are tremendous amount of solutions that we can think of. Um, waste, you know, again, uh, it differs if it's developing or developed, because in the developing world, a lot of the waste, most of the waste happens in the field, whereas in the developed world, it happens at the consumer level. And so uh, we can discuss in the chat, in the Q and A later, if you want more about this. And on uh, conservation, you know, there's regulatory. We need to really ring fence areas of the planet and the oceans. But there's also a lot we can do. For example, you know, marine diesel is exempt of taxes, and that allows commercial fishing in the outer seas that couldn't occur profitably. You know, if we didn't subsidize basically with tax expenditure that kind of uh, you know fit, fishing operations. And, and many more things where uh, public sector can use, be very helpful, like mapping forests, mapping ecosystems, you know, systems of uh, facial recognition of fauna that is protected and so forth. Land reforms that favor indigenous people there. We go into a lot of details on the book. So here's the book, you can learn more about it, it's on sale. And uh, uh, let me just conclude because uh, I think I spoke quite a bit. Um, clearly, um, you know, current food systems pose an existential threat to humanity, um, and, but we are reaping what we saw. And so um, this, uh, if we redress them, we can not just mitigate emissions, we can actually probably reverse warming, which is, you know, I think you, you, you might come as new to a lot of people. And we can also make the world resilient to food insecurity, to pandemics, and to macroeconomic and political instabilities, which usually originates in failing states that are poor and where people are hungry. Uh, Johan Rockstrom and David Attenborough in the latest documentary, Breaking Boundaries, just released on Netflix, show that food systems redressing is the only action that on its own can actually reverse the nine planetary imbalances of the air system. Um, the wrong policies 
that we've put in place are responsible for what we are seeing now, but we can reverse them and we can use smart country specific policies uh, to do uh, a lot of progress in this area. And the book makes a lot of country examples, you know, from Bhutan to Costa Rica to, you know, the wetlands in the UK to China to India. And, you know, it really gives you an, a sense of the successful uh, experiments that have been done with the right policies. Innovation is key, but again, it needs public policy support in all parts of the world. And I hope that I've elicited enough interest in you that you will get engaged yourself into, uh, you know, taking care uh, of our planet. And, and here I conclude. Nicoletta, thank you. That was an astonishing tour de force of an enormous system and why it is such a problematic system and the fact that we can do something about it. And if we do, we're going to solve a whole set of interconnected issues. Now we get to do a deep dive into one of those sets of solutions. And it is a very great pleasure for me to welcome our second speaker, Bruce Friedrich, who is co-founder and executive director of the Good Food Institute. Uh, the Institute has branches in the US, India, Israel, Brazil, Europe, and the Asia Pacific. It is a key player in accelerating the production of plant-based and cultivated meat, which as Nicoletta made crystal clear, has to be part of the solution to the, the food system problem that we're facing. Bruce oversees GFI's global strategy. He works with its directors and international managing directors to make sure that GFI is maximally effective in delivering the results that we also need. Bruce graduated from Georgetown Law and also holds degrees from Johns Hopkins University and the London School of Economics. And in what may be my favorite line I've ever used to introduce anybody in a speaker, uh, Bruce was named 2021 American Food Hero by Eating Well Magazine. Bruce, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Anne. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, a, that's, a, <laughs> that's a fun honor. Um, I am absolutely delighted to be here um, and uh, grateful to you, Anne, for that kind introduction and for all of the work that you and Sunil and Jay and uh, everybody at Thunderbird and everybody at the Institute for International Economic Policy uh, did on this event and the entire series and uh, honored to ride along on Nicoletta's uh, coattails have been uh, friends and colleagues for a while and grateful to her for inviting me to co-author a chapter in the book. Uh, which I have here uh, in front of me. So um, I'll build a little bit um, on the presentation that Nicoletta just gave. Um, do folks see my screen at this point? All right, yes, we do. Uh, excellent. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna chat a little bit about uh, one possible solution. Uh, Nicoletta did a pretty deep dive uh, into the harms of industrial animal agriculture, uh, just to sort of 10,000 feet um, all of the science and statistics that she put out. Uh, the inefficiency of raising crops to feed uh, to animals so that we can eat animals um, is fairly intuitive, but most people don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. So according to the World Resources Institute, the most efficient animal at turning crops into meat is the chicken. And it takes nine calories fed to a chicken to get one calorie back out in the form of that animal's meat. Um, so you're over here growing massive amounts of crops um, and it's nine times as many crops for chicken, 40 times as many crops for beef. Um, you're feeding, you're growing, so that means you need nine to 40 times as much land, nine to 40 times as much water. Um, it incentivizes monocropping, uh, which as Nicoletta was talking about is extraordinarily bad for the soil and leads to soil desertification. Um, nine times as many pesticides and herbicides uh, per calorie and so on. Uh, but it's not just that, you're then shipping all of those crops to the feed mill and you're operating the feed mill. You're shipping the feed uh, to the feedlot um, or the industrial farm, you're operating the farm. Um, and then you're shipping the animals to the slaughterhouse and you're operating the slaughterhouse. So it's multiple extra stages of pollution spewing vehicles and energy intensive vehicles, um, as well as uh, polluting and energy intensive factories. And once you crunch all the numbers, you get uh, the various um, adverse external costs that uh, Nicoletta just laid out. So uh, bad for climate and ecosystems, which she covered extremely well. 
um, extraordinarily inefficient. So it throws subsistence farmers and fishers off their land and out of their livelihoods. Um, and it drives up the price of cereals. So um, there was a report about biofuels driving up the price of cereals and contributing to malnutrition and starvation. Um, something on the order of 10 to 12 times as many crops are fed to chickens and pigs and other farm animals as go into biofuels. So um, an even more uh, extreme example of that. Um, and then as Nicoletta talked about, antibiotic resistance and pandemics are also contributed to uh, by this system. So what's the solution? Um, I mean, I, I guess the main thing uh, to underline as we're thinking about solutions is that uh, a book called Diet for a Small Planet uh, by Francis Moore LePay uh, is the thing that turned me uh, into a plant-based eater more than 30 years ago. The book came out 50 years ago this year. Um, and yet what we have found, even in the United States, is that per capita meat consumption just keeps going up and up and up. And I would say, you know, we see reports like this. Um, there are peer reviewed journal reports that make these points on a fairly constant basis. Um, so this is are just a few of them. The profound planetary consequences of eating less meat, which came out of the Eat Lancet report, 16,000 scientists signed dire warning over humanity, over the fate of the planet, um, huge reduction in meat eating, essential to avoid climate breakdown. These are three massive peer review scientific studies that encourage people to eat 90% uh, or less uh, meat than we're consuming now. Um, and yet this is the trajectory of meat consumption. Um, even in the United States, 2019 was the highest per capita meat consumption in recorded history. Uh, we don't have 2020 numbers yet. Um, COVID, you know, who knows what COVID did to this number, but um, 2019, highest per capita meat consumption, even in the United States, um, where we are more aware of these issues than probably any place else in the rest of the world. So um, it seems like simply educating people is not working. And I think the, the reason for that um, is that food consumption is Maslow's hierarchy. It's the bottom of the pyramid. It's physiology. Um, as Daniel Kahneman, uh, the Nobel laureate in economics talks about, we've got systems one thinking and systems two thinking. And something as basic as human physiology appears to be systems one thinking. Um, this is why um, the developed economies, people in developed economies just keep getting heavier and heavier and heavier, um, even though we know how to not make that happen. Um, so even though people know about this, uh, per capita meat consumption keeps going up. And as Nicoletta pointed out, uh, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization is suggesting it will need to be 50 to 100% greater by 2050. Uh, so then what's the solution? Um, the solution, we definitely need to educate people. Um, we especially need policymakers educated, scientists educated, and others who can do things at a macro level um, educated. But the solution doesn't seem to be um, keep trying to convince people to eat less meat. That has been tried literally for decades. Um, and it's a good thing to do, but it's probably not gonna work at a macro level. Um, at GFI, we think the solution is to make meat better. So uh, meat is made up of lipids, aminos, minerals, and water. That is 100% of what constitutes meat. Uh, plants also have lipids, aminos, minerals, and water. Um, and up until about a decade ago, if you talked about veggie burgers or veggie nuggets or veggie fish or whatever, um, the entire market was um, basically homing in on vegetarians and flexitarians. It was designed to be something for people who wanted to eat less meat. And nobody had thought about, until comp the companies Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods came along, nobody had thought about the idea that we could actually create something that is indistinguishable from me. So this is my phone. 20 years ago, my phone would have had a cord and would have looked radically different. Uh, this is also my camera. Um, 20 years ago, my camera would have uh, required analog film and looked radically different. We have transformed what it means to have a phone and what it means to have a camera. Uh, the idea of plant-based meat is that we can transform what meat is and we can create something for consumers that is literally indistinguishable um, from the experience of making animal-based meat, but we're doing it with plants um, such that it eliminates most of those external harms. And because it is so much more efficient, as it scales up, it will actually cost less. 
And then for people who want to eat actual animal meat, um, instead of all of the inefficiency of growing, you know, for chicken, nine times the crops, nine times the land, nine times the water, nine times the pesticides and herbicides, um, let's just feed the cells directly. Um, if you want to grow a chicken to slaughter weight, again, the most, most efficient animal at turning crops into meat, it's going to take you six or seven weeks just to get the animal from out of the shell to the slaughterhouse. Um, with cultivated meat, growing the meat directly in cultivators, you can get that same growth in six days. So it's the exact same meat, but much less likelihood of bacterial contamination, no possibility of pesticide or herbicide residues, no possibility of antibiotic residues, no dioxins or heavy metals if you're talking about cultivated fish, um, and a far more efficient way of producing the exact same product. Uh, Bill Gates says that up until the idea of plant-based and cultivated meat, agriculture was the third rail of climate policy because nobody could come up with a climate solution that analogized to renewable energy, that analogized to electrification of transport. Everything required massive international coordination or it required that, and or it required that consumers pay more for alternative products. The idea of plant-based and cultivated meat is that there is no behavior change required at all from consumers. Just like the idea of renewable energy is to make it less, less expensive such that it just becomes how we power our lives. Just like the idea of electrification of transport is to make them what consumers buy uh, because they give consumers everything they like about transport but more efficiently and less expensively. Exact same thing with plant-based and cultivated meat. Uh, Bill Gates talks about how this is the electrify everything of meat. And it's literally the one ag solution that he is enthusiastic about um, for these reasons. Uh, preliminary analysis of the plant-based meat companies uh, indicate that it's about a 10th of the climate change um, and something like a ninth to one one hundredth of the water use, um, one twentieth of the land use. And these numbers only get better as these products become more efficient. Um, similarly, with cultivated meat, uh, GFI contracted. We we contracted. We uh, worked with the agriculture. Well, I'm sorry, the Agency of Science, Technology, and Research um, in Singapore. So that's Singapore's version of the National Science Foundation, um, as well as 15 companies working under NDA. So again, these are preliminary figures. These figures only get better as this industry scales up. So with sort of smallish scale by 2030, these are the life cycle analysis numbers that you get. Um, and uh, the other thing just to mention, and, and Nicoletta talked about this, but I want to underline that more than 70% of antibiotics produced globally by the pharmaceutical industry are fed to farm animals. It's leading to antibiotic resistance, which is going to be killing 8 million people per year by 2050 at a cost of about $10 trillion per year by 2050. The former head of the World Health Organization said the end of working antibiotics is the end of modern medicine. So Europe is making great strides on antimicrobial resistance, which is the same thing as antibiotic resistance, uh, but solving it in Europe doesn't solve it in the US. It doesn't solve it in China. It doesn't solve it in developing economies. Antibiotics don't know international boundaries. And the thing about plant-based meat and cultivated meat is it takes your food's contribution from an to antibiotic resistance from huge to zero because no antibiotics required. Same basic thing with pandemic uh, prevention. The UN, FA, the UN Environment Program released this report last July, preventing the next pandemic. They listed the seven most likely causes of the next pandemic. The first one is increased meat consumption just writ large. You have animals, you have a possibility of zoonotic disease. Uh, zoonotic disease means you have a possibility of the next pandemic. Um, the second one was factory farming, because if you intensively raise animals, you depress their immune systems and you increase the likelihood that they will be diseased which means you increase the likelihood that that will jump the species barrier and create the next COVID-19, which could be more deadly and could be more transmissible. So the top two most likely causes of the next pandemic um, are animal agriculture, plant-based meat and cultivated meat takes that risk to zero if you produce your meat from plants or cultivate it from cells. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the Good Food Institute. Um, this, I'm happy to share uh, this deck with anybody who would like to have, an would like to have it. Uh, but GFI, everything we do operates under the um, Google popularized the KPI system, objectives and key results. That's what we use. These are our three programmatic objectives. So the first one is robust science. The second one um, is government policy. The third one is getting uh, the, especially the big food and meat companies um, to transition in this direction so that we can have disruption. I mean, we can have transition rather than 
uh, transformation of the food system rather than disruption. Uh, since we're talking about policy, I will say uh, GFI's organizational battle cry globally, our number one goal is that governments should be incentivizing plant-based and cultivated meat. They should be incentivizing um, open access science. They should be incentivizing private sector. They should be funding open access science. There should be centers at top universities globally focused on making meat from plants and cultivating it from cells. Government should be incentivizing private sector research and development and governments should be supporting plant-based and cultivated meat infrastructure and manufacturing buildup. And we worked with, so uh, Bill Gates had Breakthrough Energy Ventures. He spun out an NGO earlier this year called Breakthrough Energy. Um, and these are our complementary uh, goals alongside Breakthrough Energy. Um, I will just note that governments already put billions of dollars into ag. They put tens of billions of dollars into renewable energy. They put more than a hundred billion dollars a year into global health initiatives. Um, governments should be incentivizing this transition for all of the reasons that Nicoletta uh, laid out uh, in her presentation. Um, and then my last slide, uh, GFI operates in India, Israel, Brazil, Asia Pacific out of Singapore um, and Europe out of Brussels and London. We are not in Singapore and Israel because we care what people eat in Israel and Singapore. We're in Israel and Singapore because those governments are very enthusiastic about alternative proteins and science anywhere scales everywhere. Um, so what we are trying to, to create um, is basically a global focus, something like a global space race focused on making meat from plants and cultivating meat from cells because the world is on fire um, and this is how we put it out. Um, this is just uh, how GFI maximizes impact and people who would like to get involved in alternative proteins, you can find out um, everything GFI is up to at gfi.org slash newsletters. Um, you can find me on Twitter uh, at Bruce G. Friedrich. You can find GFI on Twitter at Good Food Inst. Um, and you can also email me at Bruce F at gfi.org. Um, all right, I'm excited for the discussion. Bruce, thank you so much um, for a two absolutely compelling presentations today. And um, very good to be hearing about solutions as much as we are about problems because the portrayal of the problems is pretty devastating. It is very clear that we are not going to go on with the food system that we have right now because as Nicoletta's slides show, it's literally unsustainable. We cannot have this food system 20, 30 years from now. It won't be producing food for the number of people in the world. Um, and the system that we have now is not producing the right kinds of food and getting it to the right people at the right times. So, Lots of questions piling up in the Q&A and I invite you all to keep them coming. Some of them we're answering live um, in, in text, but please do keep putting your questions in the q and I'm gonna lead off with one question and then turn it over to Sunil for one and then we'll keep bringing in the ones from the Q&A. So my own background is in international affairs and you're talking constantly about a global system and you're talking about how GFI is international. Nicoletta, you're talking about policies that need to be adopted every place. Is there any place in the global system where a conversation about how do you bring about systemic structural change in the global food system is even happening? Or is this all very episodic country by country, market by market? Is, and if it isn't happening, how and where could it happen? There's one question that was, that was in the Q&A about the UN Global Food Summit that's coming up. Those can be useful convenings, but we need structural and systemic change. Where is it happening or is it happening? And if not, what do we do about that? And so maybe uh, I can uh, get at that and, and Bruce can uh, um, talk about the industry word and what's what's moving there. I think at the um, sort of um, governmental level, there are a number of really uh, new initiatives which are uh, happening. One, of course, this year is the United Nations all the meaning all agencies involved, the United Nations Food System Summit. And that is in the fall. And the, we've been working on that for the whole year. And the, uh, this is not the standard summit because it's really uh, meant to continue after the leader's declaration into concrete actions at the country level. And the organizers have created some action tracks and the action tracks are being uh, declined at the country level and um, the you know stakeholders have been involved you know nationally to really push uh, individual domestic you know nations to take actions and to devise 
food policies uh, also with and under the guidance of, you know, uh, through cross-fertilization of, you know, the mines within the Food System Summit uh, system, which, which now has been put into place. So that's, that's one area. The other area, of course, is the, the EAT uh, f forum. The EAT has been created, you know, uh, years back. And uh, they one of the first things they've done was the, the EAT Lancer report, which had a tremendous kind of impact and uh, intellectual impact and policy impact. Um, and, and they are very active in the area, for example, of uh, good food finance, which is you know, how to mobilize finance to make uh, change happen in food systems, which often, uh, you know, finance is the uh, tap. But there are a number of other initiatives which I maybe want to point out. One is, you know, I am one of the technical experts in a group by the UNDP, UNEP, and FAO, and we just... Uh, we're soon to release a global report on the role of agricultural subsidies and fiscal policies in shaping the food systems as we know now. We show what are the, the risks and, and damages caused by what we've done with the subsidies, the way we've, you know, we've um, really directed them and possibly the, not the best way. And we show pathways to sustainability in redressing this. And this is really a joint effort of you know, many IFIs, if you wish, many international financial institutions, and each one of them has then the task internally to talk to their members. But there are also WTO initiatives, for example, on fish, fishing subsidies and subsidies to marine diesel, subsidies to uh, loans to the uh, construction of uh, very powerful vessels, you know, with uh, extreme engine power and, um, you know, fuel autonomy. Uh, so the WTO, um, you know, spearheaded by the U.S., which is, you know, taking the lead in trying to put an end or a change to this kind of bad subsidies, if you wish, to commercial fishing, is, is trying to find uh, international consensus on moving uh, the entire commercial fishery uh, globally towards a more sustainable, you know, way of doing business. And, and so that, you know, in the various subsectors of food, there are lots of action, um, both at the national and the international level. Um, and since, you know, as we said, there are like various components to this complex system, it's hard to say, you know, there's an overarching thing. But I think the Food System Summit will be the place where all these individual action are now discussed and will be uh, summarized and debated and pushed forward, hopefully, for the years to come. Thank you, Nicoletta, for a really comprehensive um, response. Bruce, I know you're going to have to leave us a little bit early. So in addition to asking you to talk about what's happening in terms of global market development, any other comments that you want to make, please go ahead. Oh, that's very kind of you, Anne. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to reiterate what Nicoletta said. Uh, the Global Food Set, the UN Food System Summit, um, GFI is is super active um, across all of our um, six organizations. So GFI is six independent um, organizations, and we're coordinating um, out of the United States, but um, with uh, very tightly with the government of Israel um, and the government of the UK and the government of Denmark. There's a lot of enthusiasm. Um, for making meat from plants uh, and cultivating meat from cells and then going from the UN Food System Summit uh, into COP26 um, and pointing out, you know, as, as sort of loudly and vigorously as we can, um, that this is the food and ag solution that scales and that governments should be incentivizing it. So um, the uh, United States on Earth Day, uh, John Kerry announced the Ag Innovation Mission for Climate. Um, which we're very, very excited about. So um, the agriculture and climate, um, as I mentioned, had sort of been the third rail of climate policy. And um, the Biden administration was getting hit pretty hard for not uh, taking ag's contribution to climate as seriously as they need to. Uh, GFI worked with um, 15 House members and three senators, um, as well as a bunch of other people to push pretty hard uh, for uh, John Kerry to, to put. Uh, agriculture onto the global climate agenda, and then as a part of that, um, to put um, alternative proteins firmly into that as well. Um, the way this moves out of niche market um, and into 
legit solution to the problem on a grand scale. Uh, the products really do need to be uh, both to reach both price and taste parity. Um, and for them to reach price and taste parity, um, governments need to get involved. Governments need to, and, and that's starting to happen. So um, last year was the first year that the US government had put money into alternative proteins. They put $5 million in, 3.5 through National Science Foundation, a million through the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Uh, we're working closely with both of those um, agencies, as well as many members of Congress to try to increase that number. Um, we're seeing, as I mentioned, tens of millions of dollars in Israel and Singapore, um, probably tens of millions of dollars in Europe, um, lots of private sector activity encouraged by the governments in India and Brazil. So, uh, but it needs to happen as fast as possible. I mean, Nicoletta uh, underlined, I think, very uh, expertly what we're looking at in terms of antibiotic resistance and pandemic risk and climate and biodiversity. Um, this cannot happen quickly enough. Um, and it is honestly the only ag solution that is likely to work. Everything else that has been tried has so far not worked. It, you know, it, it hasn't met the moment. Um, so um, I encourage everybody on the call, uh, feel free to, to check out what GFI is doing. We're happy to get you involved. Um, and any um, connections that you have, especially at USDA, NSF, um, or if you're not at the, in the United States, at the equivalent agencies in your governments, um, this is the future of meat. And I guess the last thing to say is um, the options for the US government are not status, you know, we incentivize this um, or we keep the status quo. Um, any more than 20 years ago, the options were solar panels or no solar panels. So 80% of solar panels are coming in from China, way north of 90% of lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles are produced in China. Um, this is going to be the future of meat. Um, and governments need to get involved and incentivize it, or we will be exporting ag jobs um, to other countries rather than keeping them in the United States. So uh, that's the last thing. Uh, that's the last thing I'll say. Great. Thank you so much, Bruce, um, and thank you for joining us. I know you have to duck out in a couple of minutes. Sunil, I know you have lots of questions you want to pose. Okay. So um, both of you have um, used scientific knowledge to lay out a really daunting agenda. So, so my issue really here is to accomplish that in the time frame that we are thinking about in terms of, you know, given looming climate change, a, how do we translate, translate this into really political action? You know, it, there's going to be a lot of resistance. Um, scientific mindset requires you to say that we know a lot of things, but we don't know everything. Um, how do you translate, translate that into policy and slogans, which will to accomplish what you're asking, um, really change people's minds and people's behavior. Um, you know, to, to, to paraphrase um, Eisenhower, plans are often useless, but planning is everything, right? And, and, and given what you just laid out, um, there will be disruption with business as usual. And we have to motivate the political system uh, to be able to comprehend that um, and deliver on the planning and the disruption, possible disruption. Have you thought about that? Uh, maybe I, I can react to that and if Bruce has time to, to say something too. So let me really quick. But, you know, usually politicians move when you're either in a crisis or it's very evident that there's a win win, you know, on their side too. And I think for politics, which is usually very short, uh, quite myopic in terms of, you know, horizon because of the electoral cycle returns to any policy have to be really uh, quick. Um, and I've shown in other, other work that, you know, for, for example, for the post COVID recovery, investing in industrial agriculture, continue to spend our money, you know, our scarce money now onto subsidizing this wrong, you know, monocrops and, you know, industrial animal operations is really not returning uh, the jobs and the, the GDP every dollar you put in, you leak out, you leak out dollars. And a lot of the, you know, uh, for example, those orders, okay, some of those larder houses open. I mean, that meat wasn't going to the US consumer. You know, it was, so it was, you could say it was risking, you know, American lives in production lines for, um, you know, consumers in other parts of the world. So, you know, that's, that's the data, it's not me saying it. Uh, so, so the issue here is, 
can we create jobs? Can we resuscitate this economy, defibrillate them by continuing the same food system subsidies and uh, taxpayer money? Or can we invest this money in something which is visibly and quickly a uh, much bigger return? People got smarter. People know that we're killing the environment. People know that food is killing themselves. They notice the interactive association of COVID and preconditions. People know that if they were uh, overweight, if they had heart disease, you know, if they had diabetes, which are diet related, they were more at risk of death. And, and therefore, you know, COVID really raised that sensitivity about food. People, you know, it's true that meat went up in 19. I think there was a lot of people in the back here doing barbecue to sort of as a comfort food, maybe during even 2020. But there's also been quite, uh, quite an uptick in plant-based food, right? In the hundreds percent increase in the in plant-based, uh, you know, food, food type that, that resemble, you know, meat. So um, I think now it's a moment for to push politicians all angle from consumers, from industry who has vision about profits, you know, even just cynically, and uh, for uh, institution, international organizations, academia, to say, look, this is a win, 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 win. I mean, if, if you change now, you will be reelected, you'll do good, you know, you, you'll go on the history books, you know, you, you are a visionary, but also these are the 10 years we have. I mean, you know, people need to understand there's not going to be another 10 years like this. It's not something we can push to, okay, we're going to do it in 2030. No, this, these are the years. We have a few years, nine years to completing the task and failure is not an option. I think politicians need to understand that and we need to make a lot of noise, I think, from all parts. Yeah, let me just, uh, I just want to underline for a second the, the point I made a, a second ago about China um, because uh, it has, we have uh, getting, been getting a lot of resonance. Uh, by pointing out um, that solar production and solar panels have plummeted in price more quickly than any experts predicted. Um, and that is 100% because of Chinese production. Um, similarly with lithium ion batteries uh, for electric vehicles, China has 93 gigafactories, the US has four. China is gonna have 140 by 2030, the US is gonna have 10. Um, so Joe Biden is standing up in front of the joint session of Congress talking about US solar panel production um, and US lithium ion battery production. And in the American jobs plan, it's one jobs, it's two infrastructure and it's three out innovate China. Uh, the trick isn't to say, hey, they won these other wars, let's try to catch up. The trick is to say what's next. Um, and what's next is remaking meat. Um, similar to what Nicoletta just said, uh, the country that gets out in front of this solves the land and ag contribution to climate. Um, has bragging rights until the end of time for divorcing meat production from the need for live animals um, and eliminating the contribution of meat to antibiotic resistance, pandemic risk, and slashing uh, the adverse impact on the climate. So um, we think the Out Innovate China is a bipartisan argument that can really work with Democrats who are prioritizing it as the you know, third pillar of the jobs plan, um, as well as Republicans who don't want to see US jobs and US manufacturing exported overseas. It happened to us on solar panels. It's happening to us on lithium ion batteries. Let's not have it happen to us on meat. Um, I, will, I just want to uh, thank you again, um, Anne and, and everybody at, uh, at the, um, this, uh, this session was great. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you again, Nicoletta, for inviting me to be a part of it. Um, I really appreciate that. I do have to run. Thank Thanks you so much, Bruce. Thank you very Thanks, much. Bruce. Thank you. Um, so Nicoletta, I'm glad you can stay for, for just a few more minutes because, oh boy, are there lots of questions happening. Um, some in the, in the Q&A and some that have been piling up in my mind as we've been speaking. Um, one that I think is related, and I don't know whether the book was able to address this as a topic, and if not, um, I'd love to know more about it. Just at the, at the same time that the alternative meat market is, is heating up, so is the carbon offset market. And there is a very strong connection because of the climate issues and because of the car carbon sequestration potential of soils and of, of the changes in practices that we're talking about. Um, clearly, a lot of the location for carbon offsets is going to be in land that should be rewilded or restored, taken out of agricultural production, or in which the agricultural production should change how it is done. Um, is anything going on in terms of thinking about how we bring funding 
for agricultural transformation from the carbon offset market? And if so, how do we do that in a way that doesn't allow the kind of financialized gains that the carbon offset market so far has been very subject to? Is there a way to bring these things together? Yeah, so uh, I mean, it, it, it's uh, the initiatives in terms of carbon offsets for agriculture are in their infancy. Uh, and to some extent, you know, remember the 1980s, uh, Tom Love, Joy, Debt for, uh, Debt for Nature initiatives, uh, some of that was kind of similar to the concept of, it wasn't really related to carbon, but it was more related to biodiversity conservation, the value of that, independently of the carbon, you know, sequestration, um, paying countries or like um, writing off some of the debt. So, you know, they would promise conservation. Now, in the carbon uh, arena, one, uh, the voluntary market's being created that, you know, if you do the right thing and you sequester carbon, some, uh, some investors might just pay you for that. Imagine a big corporation producing cars that has pledged to its consumer base that it will be net zero by 2050. How do they do that? Because their process, you know, their, their factory line cannot, I mean, it does emit. Even if they go renewable, you know, there'll be some emissions. So to get to that net zero, they need to buy offset somewhere. So the carbon price will, is expected to grow tremendously because, you know, of course, uh, supply of carbon sequestration outstrips demand given you know, consumer uh, desire for companies to do the right thing, government pledges to doing the right thing. And agriculture can contribute to this market, of course. But the problem with agriculture is that uh, carbon, of course, is, uh, you know, it's, it's a mobile, uh, you know, element. And uh, so you have to be very careful how you structure these markets because you could say, you know, I'm going to pay a farmer to sequester carbon in the soil for a number of years. Uh, first of all, it's, it's quite hard to measure carbon in the soil, and there's differences in carbon in the first few inches of the soil and profound deep carbon. You could easily uh, throw, you know, a low track of manure and carbon would measure like really amazing carbon levels, <laughs> but you just uh, construed, you know, that before measurement. Um, and then if the contrast is not long enough, uh, you know, say the second or third year it expires, you got your money for your carbon offsets and then you just tail and release carbon and then you do it again, sign a new contract, you know. Um, it's the same with, you know, with forestry offsets. So you can easily buy a tree, but you cannot guarantee that the tree is going to be there after they sold it to you. They can fall that tree and then sell another tree to someone else, or it could be the same trees sold three times. So uh, the difference in carbon markets today is that we now have um, satellite imagery and record, you know, diagnostic and facial recognition, including of you know, fauna and flora. Uh, so it's a little bit easier, but for agriculture's crop, it's, it's a bit trickier. And so, um, you know, one has to be careful when you devise these systems to um, have regulatory bodies that are trustworthy in measurement. They have the right tools. Uh, the contracts are long enough to allow proper measurements of carbon sequestration. And, you know, this is scientifically a given, you know, you can just tweak with it. Um, and also there is uh, ideally cross compliance with conservation. Um, a lot of subsidies can easily be given on top of subsidies that are given to do the wrong thing. And then the question is, are these carbon offset paid either by the public or by other markets doing any additional sequestration or are, are doing anything to mitigate the positive emissions to bring them to you know, the red or the negative territory? Or they're just shaving off you know, just a little bit of the, of the, of the bad carbon. And, these questions are um, scientifically, um, you know, verifiable propositions uh, that, you know, we can address, but it's not just easy as throwing more money at the system. I mean, we need to, I think, remove the money that does, that has people doing and taking the wrong behavior and redirecting at people that do the right behavior. And it could be the same people, you know, the same people that, that farm in a certain way, they move to farm the right way. So that's what the book, you know, goes into all these mechanisms to explain how we can be have waterproof 
uh, foolproof policies. Yeah, I'm, I would love to figure out a way to make the carbon offset market be a source of funding for the bigger transformations that we need to make, both for the food system and for biodiversity. But I think we have a very, very long way to go before those markets are, are anything other than tweaking around the edges for all the reasons you just laid out. Sunil, last question goes to you. So, so Nicoletta, this is, we are running out of time. So I'm gonna ask you if, you know, so, so what would be a quick slogan to get people really animated about um, uh, food systems? I mean, or is this just too complex an area for us to, um, to, 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 to sort of synthesize to get all the power we can uh, socially? Um, I think, I mean, COVID was a, was a big uh, awakener um, for, because people had time to look at the backyard and, you know, understand some of these issues. I think, uh, you know, it, it's a bit of a, we know that the recovery money didn't go in this direction. It went to, um, you know, maybe the wrong wrong direction and it wasn't it wasn't a green stimulus so far uh, but i think engaging ourselves uh in individually like i you know i wasn't a food expert like three four years ago i mean one should never underestimate the power of the individual you know we should all in all our community we climate change you know is not like the Second World War, you know, you needed one Winston Churchill to turn the ship around and, and save the day. Climate change, you need uh, a million Winston Churchills. And we all are Winston Churchill today. So I think anything we can do individually in our communities, in our schools, you know, in our universities, in our voting and voting through consumer preferences, you know, when you eat, uh, there, there are books out there, you know, no animal protein before dinner. That's not a big sacrifice. You know, just think about it. It could change, transform the planet. So, you know, just start there and then it, it will grow into something bigger than you can possibly uh, even ever imagine. I have, and, uh, you know, I'm not saying I'm making a difference, but, you know, I, I feel like I'm doing something. I don't feel impotent. I think that's a, a great note to, to pull this to a conclusion because we are just about out of time. Um, I think what we've heard today is an extraordinary overview of a systemic problem that most people do not understand as a system, systemic problem, even though they can see the bits and pieces of what's wrong. We've also heard a great deal about potential solutions. Um, I can only as strongly as possible recommend to everyone who is listening that you get and look at this book. Uh, there are chapters in there about, some of which relate to some of the questions we didn't get to in the Q&A about things like different forms of agriculture, of polycultures as opposed to the big monocultures that have been the, the source of the problem. How do you actually do those? I think my favorite single anecdote in there, in the chapter that's talking about dietary changes for the wealthier countries is what Japan has, has done with school lunches. It seems like such a very simple thing, but not only have they worried about making the school lunches healthy, but they have also used them as educational opportunity for everyone who has gone through public, the public school system in Japan, which means you have a population that basically understands nutrition. And that may have something to do with the fact that Japan alone among all of the wealthier countries doesn't seem to have a huge problem with obesity and overweight, not to the degree that the other, other wealthy countries do. The book is full of wonderful points of catalyst, ways in which systems can be changed. And at the same time, it makes very, very clear how urgent this problem is. Because as Nicoletta said, this is not something we can put off for 10 years. We don't have a food system that works for humanity or that works for the planet. And unless we start fixing this right now, we are going to have catastrophe coming in the near future for a whole set of environmental and social and economic reasons. And we don't have to let that happen. So with that, let me thank all of you for joining us today. Let me thank Bruce in his absence and Nicoletta for providing what, from my mind, has been one of the best webinars I've ever been involved in. I'm very glad that this is going to be recorded and for anyone who is listening, the recorded the link will be sent to you. 
Uh, we always get quite a few people watching the recordings, especially in Asia, given the time that we are currently on. And let me also thank Jay and Sunil and the Elliott School at George Washington University, the Institute of International Economic Policy for joining me in this last of our webinar series together. So thank you very much. And I wish everyone a good day.